Okay, so we are on the first sheet. This is uh, section three, lesson one. And this section, which only has three lessons to it, is going to be under the heading of the preparation for ministry of Jesus. Today, we're going to be looking at Luke chapter three, verses one to 20, which is the ministry of John, John the Baptist. Now, <clears throat> just to take a moment to, to reflect back on where we've come. We, we spent the first section basically with Luke telling us what this book is about in the prologue and so forth. The last section that we just finished, which was seven lessons long, gave us Luke's account of uh, the pregnancies of who for John? Who was John's mama? John the Baptist. Elizabeth, Elizabeth and Zacharias. Okay, so we heard about that. And then we heard the announcement about uh, Mary going to have a baby. And then we come back to uh, John being born. And then we come back to Jesus being born. And then we come back, we go stay kind of with Jesus about his growing up. Last week we were talking about when he went into the temple, remember, at age 12, and we saw kind of his formative years and, and what that was about. Okay, so now we are fast forwarding. We were at age 12 for Jesus, and now we are fast forwarding about 18 years, give or take, to about, this would be about 27 AD. I believe Jesus was born probably 3 or 4 AD, or BC, I'm sorry, 3 or 4 BC. So you take 30 years from that, that gets you to about 27. Uh, so we are, uh, we know that a little bit too from the first clue in our text. Let's read our text and then we'll get into it. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod Tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, Tetrarch of Ituria and Traconitus, and Lysanias, Tetrarch of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked roads shall become straight, the rough ways smooth, and all people will see God's salvation. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The ax is already at the root of the trees and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What should we do then? The crowd asked. John answered, anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none. And anyone who has food should do the same. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you're required to, he told them. Then soldiers asked him, and what should we do? He replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. 
And with many other words, John exhorted the people and proclaimed the good news to them. But when John rebuked Herod, the Tetrarch, because of his marriage to Herodias, his brother's wife, and all the other evil things he had done, Herod added this to them all. He locked John up in prison. Okay, so as we get started this morning, uh, we find John out baptizing. Where, where does the idea of baptizing come from? Does it come from John? Did he make this up? Or does it come from some other place? It comes from some other place. Okay. Okay, remember how we have been emphasizing that Luke is intent on telling the story of Jesus, not just about, the, about Jesus and the facts and the figures and all of that stuff. He is intent on bringing his hearers uh, a version of the story that is a natural fulfillment of the things that have been going on before, prophecies and the law and all of that kind of stuff. Actually, the practice of baptism goes back to the days of the law with Moses and so forth. It was not called baptism back in those days because baptism is actually a Greek word. And that wouldn't have been appropriate for them since they spoke Hebrew. The word that is used was a, uh, a mikvah. A mikvah. That sounds Jewish, doesn't it? Mikvah. Ay, mikvah, right? I mean, that, yeah, okay. That actually refers to, and you, you can read about this in Leviticus and among other places, uh, where when people, you know how people were oftentimes considered clean or unclean, right? Depending on certain things that they did, and they had to go through a cleansing process. Remember when we were talking about uh, you know, Mary and uh, Elizabeth, when they were presenting their babies, and particularly with Mary, we were talking about a cleansing process that, that women went through especially, but it wasn't just about women, it was about all people. And so a part of the cleansing process was to experience a mikvah. And a mikvah, very much like we understand baptism, was a time when a person would basically be submerged under the water. It was, a, it was an act of cleansing, okay? Now, this is important because this act of cleansing is, the, is kind of the mindset, a part, part of that mindset that John is trying to communicate as he's going forward in the wilderness and is baptizing, okay? So a couple of things here. Once again, we find the narrative of the life of Jesus building on things that people were already familiar with. It wasn't as if John just said, I think I'm going to invent some new thing and let's do that. No, what he did, and this is a pattern that we should take notice of, what he did was he took something from that history that, that the, of the past and integrated that into it, bringing on a different dimension to it. And in fact, he alludes to that at the end of this, doesn't he? When, when they're wondering if he is Messiah, what is his answer to them? He immediately goes to baptism. And he said, okay, I'm baptizing you for this reason, but when he comes, in other words, so... And, and later on in the book of Acts, when the church is getting started, one of the points of confusion that we discover there, again, the book of Acts written by the same guy, Luke, one of the things that we notice is that there were some believers who had experienced John's baptism, but had not experienced the dimension of the Holy Spirit, which is a component of the baptism that we experience today. Okay, so these are... It, just more illustration of how this was built upon. Uh, do you remember your baptism? Yeah, what do you remember about it? It was wet. Okay, got it. We, yeah. What, what do you remember about it? Do you know when it was? Okay. 
I remember my three-year-old cousin sitting on the front pew saying, what is Karen doing in the water? <laughs> <laughs> A good question. A good question. Right. Okay. So uh, how many of you were baptized in a, in a church building? How many of you were baptized out of doors? Okay. Uh, how many of you were baptized indoors but not in a church building? You might say, well, how could that happen? Actually, I've baptized people in hospitals. Uh, I've gone down to uh, like physical therapy, where they do physical therapy and have baptized people in, in some of those situations. Uh, uh, have baptized a person in jail and did that in a, that uh, was a weird one, uh, as you can imagine. But uh, this is, uh, anyway, this is where this practice comes from. And it is a, one of the things that essentially all churches uh, have in common is that all churches practice baptism in some form or fashion. Okay, have you noticed that? Yeah, every church does that. Now, uh, it's the form and fashion and, and all of the other things that, that, you know, there's a lot of division about. But it's one thing that, uh, that essentially Christians agree on is that baptism is, a, is an important part of one's faith walk with Jesus. And so uh, we need, to, we need to, to see that. Now, as we get into the word, uh, going down to that next section, I want you to focus on verse 2 with me. And we're going to ask this question. What was the trigger that launched John's prophetic ministry? According to verse 2. The word of God came to him. The word of God came to him. What do you think that means? The word of God came to him. Hmm. That's a good question, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. Well, oftentimes that's a, that's a phrase that is used to describe what happens when a prophet receives a prophecy. The word, of, the word of the Lord came to them. And there was, you know, I, I cannot tell you exactly how that phenomenon works, but apparently for John and for other prophets who we have their writings in Scripture, there is a significant difference, distinction, between what they considered or what they viewed something that came from the, the word of God or it was the word of God as opposed to just some other thought that they might have had. Good, not necessarily a bad thought, but, you know, there's a difference between a, and it, I guess, an inspired kind of scriptural thought versus just other thoughts that might be of a different origin. Where do you get your thoughts Maybe I don't want to know the answer to this, okay? <laughs> but seriously, where do, you, where do your thoughts come from? Sometimes I wonder. <laughs> okay. Well, let's do it together. Let's wonder together, okay? Uh, what, what you put into. Okay, yeah. It's, it's, uh, when, you, when you stop and just kind of analyze it, it's, it really kind of de depends on uh, what your mind is focused on. You know, hmm, there's a major clue with respect to spiritual life, isn't it? What are, what are you feeding on, right? Yeah, I can tell you this. If we had a fellowship lunch here every Sunday, I would be fatter, right? Because you can't eat like that all the time, can you? No. Well, you can, but you probably shouldn't. Okay, but it's a product of what you're, you're feeding on. Now, What's important to understand, and Paul says this more clearly in 2 Timothy chapter 3, he says that all Scripture is God-breathed. That's a, that's a very distinctive difference, okay? And that's essentially what John, where Luke is saying about John, that, that somehow God's Spirit started working inside of him and started saying the things that God wanted him to say. Okay, so this is the word of the Lord came to him. 
Now, we said, going back to those dates and how we can know kind of more precisely when that is, you'll notice that we're given some clues, aren't we? Uh, at the very beginning of this, there, are, there is only a certain amount of time when, the, when all of the things that are mentioned as reference points that were going on when this happened could be said that were true. Okay, so what do we know about the time that this happened? Well, it had to be, dur- it had to be the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar. Okay, we're pretty certain when we know exactly when that is. But even if you give or take a little bit, you know, you can have a fair idea, which puts us in the ballpark of about 26 or 27 A.D. But then, you know, it has to also correspond with these other rulers. There are several rulers here. The next one is Pontius Pilate, who is a governor of Judah. Okay, so uh, Tiberius Caesar is the emperor Okay, Uh, we find Pontius Pilate is the governor over the area of Judea that we're talking about. And then the area of Judea was broken down into what are called tetrarchs. Okay, that's that word. Do you know what tetrarch means? Four. Right, four divisions. Okay, and you'll notice that there are four mentioned. Now, again, all of these have to line up. You see that? For this to really know, it has to be the 15th. It has to be, okay, when, when Pontius Pilate is governor of Judah, Herod is the tetrarch of Galilee. His brother Philip is tetrarch of Eteria and Tecronius, uh, and Licinius, tetrarch of Abilene. It was also during, here's another one. It was also during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas. So it is during this time when, when all of that was true, this is when it happened. Now, why do you think Luke is giving us all this detail? Any, any thoughts about that? He's like a nerd or something and just, you know, kind of into all that? specific timeline, plus it, it verifies facts. Yeah. Do you suppose that there might be people sometime after Luke wrote this that might question whether any of this is true? I'm glad Luke is a little bit OCD, aren't you? Yeah. God loves OCD people too, you know? I don't know how, but he does. No, I'm kidding. Uh, but, but seriously, this is, this, is, this is important. This isn't just, you know, stuff that we gloss over. These are reference points. Go back in history. Look it up for yourself. You don't have to take my word for it. This is when it took place. And you'll discover as you dig into that, that... You can see when, when it happened. Okay, now, so going back to, uh, that, that was the catalyst. That was the trigger, was the, the coming of the word of God. Now, uh, Pilate, Herod, and the next bullet into, into the word. Pilate, Herod, Annas, and Caiaphas will play significant roles in the life of Jesus. What is their jurisdictions compared to the jurisdiction of Messiah? This is kind of a trick question, but we'll see what we come up with. How did their, what, what was the, uh, what was Pilate's jurisdiction? Judea. What's that? Judea. Judea. What was Herod's? Oh. What's that? Oh, Galilee. Galilee. He was a tetrarch of Galilee. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, and Annas and Caiaphas, what was their jurisdiction? The uh, or the temple, yeah, they were the chief priests. Okay, now, so we we've got we've got all of these rulers, you know, we're we're heard, and they're we're given their areas of jurisdiction and so forth. What is the jurisdiction of Messiah? Yeah, one of the things that. I guess we've talked about from the beginning that Luke is doing is he is setting up this this picture of of power and authority. And one of the things that Jesus does is he speaks truth to power. He speaks truth to authority. 
Now, uh, we're going to find Jesus doing something that all of us are later encouraged to do by the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans, and that is to submit to authority. We're supposed to submit to the authorities that we find ourselves. Well, what does that mean? Well, depends what jurisdictions you're talking about, doesn't it? Okay. Uh, that means just, and, and by the way, you know why we should do that? Is it because the jurisdictions are always right? No. No. Because, well, we are told to. That's a good one. That was one you worked for my mom a lot. You know, when I asked her why, because I told you that that seemed to be a good answer. But uh, as we go through this together, we're going to discover that's exactly what Jesus did. He submitted. Do you realize how ironic that is? Again, Paul tells us in Colossians that Jesus is that aspect of God who was the creative agent in the Garden of Eden. Essentially, what that's saying is the creator of the universe is being respectful to earthly authorities. That is so crazy. Isn't that a weird way to come in and be God? Yes. We need to learn that. Because, listen, I suspect you may struggle as I do with what, knowing what to do with certain feelings that I have about my faith and about what's going on in the world and all kinds of other things. And we have to be careful. And again, look at Jesus. You can never go wrong with Jesus. Okay, don't always look at me because if you look at me, I, I may lead you astray in some things. Okay, not intentionally, but it's just, you know, that's any human is like that. Look at Jesus. Look at how he handled these authorities. And the truth is, yes, the reign of Messiah is over everything, which brings us to the, the, uh, the third uh, bullet there. What themes make up the passage from Isaiah? We find Isaiah, the Old Testament book prophecy being quoted in verses four through six. Go back there. The, the scripture says a voice calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And then here's here's the agenda. Every valley shall be filled in. Every mountain and hill made low. The crooked roads shall become straight. The rough ways smooth and all people will see God's salvation. What is he talking about? What do you think he's talking about there? Okay. Okay. Make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in. And every mountain and hill made low. That's another way of saying that the mountains and the hills will be brought down to essentially... Basically, what he's describing is a situation where there's no distinction between the valleys and the mountains. That's weird. Isn't that weird? Yeah, I like the mountains. Don't you like the mountains? Yeah, I like the mountains. But we're not talking about that in the sense. What he's, as, as Luke has developed from the very beginning, when when he gives us the accounts of what the angel said that the ministry of Messiah was going to be about, there is a, a overall word to describe it. And you might want to write this down because we're going to see it more and more and more. It's the word transposition. Transposition. It's like T-R-A-N-S and then the word position. Transposition. What that means is that there is going to be an exchanging of position or a transfer of position. What's going to happen to the mountains? What's going to happen to the valleys? What's going to happen to the crooked roads? They're going to be straight. Yes. 
Okay, well, that's nice if we're traveling. We'll get good gas mileage on straight roads and have no elevation. That's good. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the ministry that John is introducing about Messiah. And the transposition is summarized in verse 6. What does verse 6 say? All people will see God's salvation. All people. All. Who wouldn't have seen it at this writing? Who wouldn't have been, who wouldn't have been, uh, who wouldn't it have been for? Anybody but Jews. Anybody but? Jews. Anybody but Jews. So Gentiles were persona non grata, right? They were excluded because they were not considered to be a part of God's chosen people, right? And Again, as we go back and look in the Old Testament, that was clearly not the intention of God when he called a people, his people, Israel. His people, Israel, was to be the means by which the whole world will come to know Jesus. The vehicle through, through which this would happen. Okay? Which they, you know, rejected that notion. And that's part of the reason why we find things moving forward as we do here. But what, uh, what's going on here is that the idea of salvation for all people, that means transposition. Uh, let's not talk about mountains and valleys and all that. Let's talk about transposition that the gospel brings to humanity. How does... How does the gospel, by coming into contact with the gospel, change positions? How, do, how does it help people, let's say, to change positions? New creature. New creature. There's kind of the overview of it, isn't it? Okay. I once was lost, but now I'm was blind. See, see transposition. That's what the Messiah does. Okay? Now, we need to ruminate. Do you know that word, ruminate? That's an old word. Ruminate. That means to think, to meditate, to contemplate that. That the message of the gospel is, is for all. That all people will see God's salvation. This is an introduction into not only what John is going to be up to, but what Jesus is up to. Which makes perfect sense with what Matthew says is Jesus. Remember what Jesus' last words on earth were before he ascended to the right hand of the Father? What? That was on the cross. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore and make disciples of all the nations so that the, all people will see salvation. See that? Realize through his death, burial, and resurrection, this is a weird way to save the world, that this is God's way. And so as we uh, ruminate on that, you know there are people in Fulton, Mississippi, who we may have, we may have uh, prejudices against because we can't necessarily see how they might ever come to Jesus. Right? Now, I'm not saying that they're not giving you a lot of good evidence, <laughs> you know, to help along the way. I mean, you know, living like the devil is, you know, uh, makes one wonder, right? Any of y'all ever lived like the devil? Well, good. Got a few yeses on that one. Okay. All right. Well, you want... No, we won't ask to tell us about it. <laughs> another time for another lesson, right? But do you suppose... Listen, do you suppose there are people 
in this world today who would look at you and say, I can't believe that that person is a Christian. I can't believe that they ever, because of what they were, I can't believe that that, that, that person could ever become a Christian. Now, hopefully that not said about you necessarily, but if that's, a, if that's an idea that you have, that's another one you need to ruminate on, but this time you need to get rid of it because the, the message of the gospel is that God wants all people in his family, and that means that he can break down all barriers, all barriers. It's interesting talking about the new creation in the, in the church. Paul says that in Christ there's neither male nor female, right? There's neither slave nor free. You know what that is? That's transposition. That's change in status. That's what's going on. Oh, by the way, they were living in a world where women were, weren't worth anything. But in the church, women were valuable. They were living in a world where, you know, slavery was a very common experience. But in the church, they were brothers and sisters in Christ. Okay, see? Transposition. And so part of the idea of what Jesus is doing is he is, and, and John is introducing that. He's, he's preparing the way for this, uh, for this ministry of Jesus. And part of what he's doing is he's building a crowd. Now, he uses some rather interesting methods to build a crowd. Uh, he calls a bunch of them as they come out to him. What was that? A brood of vipers? You know? I have never called anybody that. Maybe we should try that as an evangelistic tool. Attention all vipers. You know, we're having, we're having brood of viper Sunday, right? Maybe we should do that. I'd, have, I'd be willing to try it one time just to see who showed up, you know. <laughs> but but what, what's he doing here? Why is he, why is he so upset? What's he, who, why is he calling them out? Do you know why he's calling him out? Because part of what's happening is he is he's trying to create this new paradigm, this new way of thinking that Jesus is going to flesh out and show. But part of what he's doing is he is challenging the hypocrisy of the Jewish religion. And the ones who he's really has a problem with are the the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the leaders of that. Now, apparently John also has a problem with somebody else. Who's, who does it tell us at the end he has a problem with? Herod. Herod. And why? Yeah, now this, yes, this is a very fascinating uh, part of this story that oftentimes we don't we don't understand it and w we do need to understand it here's part, uh, part of what's going on here why would what what is Herod's uh, what is Herod's uh, area of jurisdiction Galilee right so he's a tetrarch is he a religious leader or is he a political, what we would call a political leader? How many of you would say that he is a religious leader? How many of you would say he is more of a political leader? Would you be surprised to know that he is exactly both? Because what was going on in the first century is that Herod and his descendants were actually in cahoots with the Jewish hierarchy and he became king or ruler of this area kind of in a, in a fashion that would make a lot of our political shenanigans look like child's play, right? Okay, so he, the reason, you know, the reason that he gets called out, you know, does this mean that, uh, you know, Caesar Tiberius doesn't have any skeletons in his closet or does this mean that, Pontius Pilate is living a perfect sin-free life? No. Why is Herod getting the attention? 
because in addition to being a political leader, he is supposed to be someone who has jurisdiction over the temple and the people of God. And John called him out on it. Now, do you know what happened to John? Well, we will get to that eventually. What happens to John? Yeah, he gets his head cut off, right? And it, it comes back to this. He was locked up in prison. So we find John going out, and he is preaching this message, and he is preparing the way of the Lord. Uh, what do we know about, um, what do we know that John accomplished in this, in this part of, what, what, what did his ministry actually accomplish, other than, than doing these things that we've said? Do we know anything about the results in terms of uh, did people accept the message? Did people reject the message? Did, did nobody care? Well, it's still some of both because, I mean, he preached the message and people accepted it. Yeah. Some people didn't accept it. Yeah, there's a lot of, and he's emphasizing a lot of behavioral changes, isn't he, as a result. But one of the things that, that John does is he is fairly successful at drawing a crowd. As evidenced later on in Scripture, when we hear references to these larger groups. You know, when we find Jesus getting up, you know, early in his ministry and like preaching the Sermon on the Mount and so forth. Where did all those people come from? I'll bet you I know where a bunch of them came from. They were probably the product of John's ministry. We, we know they were all Jewish, and that's who he was focusing on. You know. Now, what's also interesting, uh, quickly I'll mention this. You'll notice that soldiers are mentioned in verse 14. You know, the, the tax collectors, they're coming to find out what their deal is, and even soldiers. What's interesting about that is that there's some debate as to whether any Jewish person would have served as a soldier in the Roman army. And if they were not serving, if these were not Jewish people in the Roman army, then that means that these were Gentiles who were coming already to find out what's going on. That's pretty cool. Uh, as a fellow Gentile, I just want to say that's pretty cool. OK, now go down to applying the word. This is what I want to leave with you this morning. Luke seems to be emphasizing the point that the, that the things God is up to are for all people including the breaking down of some very pronounced established walls. Do you have any blind spots regarding who to share the gospel? Is anyone seemingly beyond the gospel because we cannot conceive of them accepting it? That's kind of what I was asking before. You know, are, are, are you still, do you realize that the power of, of God and his word is able to break down walls, to break down barriers and to make every mountain plain and every valley filled and every crooked road straight. And now, as we get ready to close, I hope that you will, here's your assignment, okay? This, if you do this, this means you like me, okay? <laughs> this means you really like me, okay? Uh, how many of you have ever heard of uh, a, a musical oratorio called Handel's Messiah. You ever heard of that? You ever listened to that? Okay. If you really want to, Jay's like, no. Nah. Okay, brother, here, going to get you some culture maybe. All right. No. I doubt it. Yeah, I wouldn't bet on it either, but. But then there's always hope, brother. The, the mountain will come down. Anyway, there's a, there's a, beautiful, uh, there's a beautiful section of that, it, which is this passage from Isaiah. Every valley shall be exalted. Every, you know, uh, and the rough place is plain. I mean, it's just a, a beautiful work within that. And uh, that's what this is about in, in celebration of Messiah and his ministry. So I hope, hopefully you, you are, uh, you're feeling a greater appreciation. What I'm getting from this is the intricacy of detail that God has given us with respect to things about Jesus and, and all these things that we're going through. Something I really appreciate that helps me as a follower and hopefully it will help you too. Next week, we're gonna, we're gonna get into it 
uh, on page, the second page that you got, uh, it is, uh, let's see, section 2A, which is uh, where we're going to be, we're going to find the introduction of Jesus. We're going we're gonna to actually uh, get to experience his baptism by John, okay? Very cool section. Hey, can we stand up and let's pray and let's get ready for a great worship time. Father, we do want to just praise you now for your faithfulness, for the ways that you have made it possible for us to be in your kingdom, but also have given us this wonderful testimony of your word to just help us to be grounded and to know that what you've given us is just so true. Be with us now as we prepare for worship and just bless this day. We pray in Jesus name. Amen. All right. Good to see you all.